Okay, everybody, welcome to our SCTC Awe and Wonder AAC podcast. We're so excited to be back doing another podcast, and our topic today is wait time and other strategies that are um, game changers for us, our students. Today, um, so I'm Sarah Kinsella. I'm here with Brenda Del Monte. Hi. And we're so excited to um, have Marla Nason joining us. Marla, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Marla Nason, and I'm a special education teacher at Rover Elementary in Tempe, Arizona. I have a, this is my 21st year um, teaching in, in public education. It's my 19th year in my classroom. I started out my uh, career as a music therapist at psychiatric hospital for 20 years, and then I changed careers, um, meaning to be a first grade teacher and, and fell in love mm. with my classroom. And so I've been there for 19 years after teaching music for two years. So um, oh, wow. students are, I have right now seven, I will soon have eight students. And they are in the skills classroom, which is considered the, the classroom that says uh, supporting kids and learning life skills. And so my students um, have multiple disabilities. Uh, I have five students who are mobile via wheelchair. I have um, mo- all of my students are nonverbal, although I do have one who is beginning to utter some words. Um, and my kids have unknown uh, cognitive abilities and i i say that because um i heard it once in a workshop with either linda burkhart or gretchen hanser and it really fits my kids because honestly we have no idea what their uh, cognitive ability is because their bodies don't allow them to do a lot of things to point to things or um or they're nonverbal and they haven't learned how to explain themselves in a way that testing will will show what they know. I do know that they know an awful lot. Also, several of my students have uh, cortical visual impairment. Um, in fact, the other day I was figuring out that um, out of my right now currently seven students, six of them have some sort of, of uh, visual impairment. So that's my classroom in a nutshell. What are the, wow, what's the grade you. range there? Mm-hmm. Oh, the, a grade, there, sorry. The grade range is kindergarten through eighth grade. Um, right now though, I have kindergarten through sixth grade uh, kids. Okay. So I don't know how many other people listening were like, oh my gosh, this is already exciting because we have a special ed teacher who's talking about Linda Burkhart, Gretchen Hanser, and who's saying, I know my kids have, are smart. I fell in love with my classroom. Um, I can see, Brenda, why you invited invited Marla to talk with us today. But also, um, so how do you know Marla and why why did you think of her for this wait time podcast? Yes, yes. Okay, so... um, I am a communication device evaluator and trainer, obviously through special ed technology center in Washington state, but I, um, I'm, I live in Arizona and I do evaluations and trainings in Arizona. And, um, so if a student gets a device, I usually do at least one training at the school with the special ed teacher and the SLP, the school-based SLP and that kind of thing. So I met Marla a few times through that. And after that, Marla, as her students needed AAC evaluations, I don't know, she, something happens and I always get hers. So she must have recommended me. <laughs> and then um, those families, she has incredible relationship with her families. I mean, it's personal and nobody's apologizing for that. I mean, there's no better. There's that. I mean, that's just the way it is. So I love everything about that. And so usually we do those evaluations, most evaluations I do in the home. But for Marla's students, we do uh, usually at school because um, they really want to know what Marla thinks. I mean, they really want her opinion. And what that has done for Marla is she gets to see um, why everybody in her classroom doesn't get proloquitica or why everybody doesn't get the same app or why everybody doesn't get the same whatever, because she sees the process of, oh, okay, this level of CVI means they're actually still using auditory processing and they need to do switches and, oh, they can do um, eye gaze with this size button, but not at this size button. And so we're learning. So she's seeing, she's learning as I'm learning as an evaluator, 
what the, why we're making the decisions we're making. So, so I never have any problem with Marla's buy-in period, but um, one of the reasons why is because she's part of the evaluations now. Prior to her being part of the evaluations, she definitely trusted what we decided. But I think that this, it just makes us a great team. But over the years, I mean, Marla's really diligent about getting training from people who know what they're doing. She's already dropped a couple names. And so um, her classroom is coded, you guys, with low tech and high tech and all kinds of alternate chargers and mounting equipment and you name it, she's got it. Plus um, some really redneck, jerry-rigged situations, which neither one of us are above, you know, some kind of duct tape situation might just be the best way to, to prevent something from happening or whatever. So she's kind of MacGyver that way too. Um, so I just thought she has a really great thing that happened to her. Um, I don't want to plug my book, but I'll just say that she was reading through my book and something hit her one way and she started implementing it. And it just, it changed. She said it was just kind of a game changer for her. I want you to share that story because then I was like, you know what? Everybody needs to hear that story and more. So let's get you on the podcast. So I, well, you I know what I'm Marla, talking about, right? Marla, I think, can I just, I will be the one to talk about your book, Brenda, because I think, um, so it's called, I see you in there by Brenda Del Monte. Check it out. Um, I just need to say that before you go ahead, Marla, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, um, because I love Brenda, let me just say one other thing is, you know, I, I've always had buy-in in, um, when kids bring in their um, AC device, AAC devices. However, when I've seen what Brenda recommends and how much she really listens to um the, to the families and the teacher. I, cause I've been in some evaluations before where it, at the end, I was still like really confused about why they chose one over the other, because it really didn't seem like that fit or that the kid was really interested in it. And, and you know what, the kids have to be interested, honestly. So when I heard that Brenda had a book, I read it and, you know, I, I want my kids to do well. Um, I will, help them. I will scaffold them. I will prop them up. I will do whatever I need to do to get them to, to do the best they can. However, there was a part in Brenda's book that just like stopped me in my tracks. And it, what it said was, um, and I'm paraphrasing, if I'd been in my classroom, I would have it on my wall. But basically is um, when you wait for a student to be able to do what they need to do and truly wait for them, what you are saying to them is that you truly believe that they can do it. And uh, I, I not only have that up on my wall in my classroom, but I made um, laminated posters for every single one of my kids last year for Christmas, because it, it is so important that we let our kids know that we believe that they can do it. And so what has that done? Well, first of all, I had to get buy-in from my assistants because they are really good about saying, oh, come on, come on, let's do it, let's do it. And it's like, no, we have to be quiet and we have to let them do it. And just now and then you just say, you know, uh, this is the question in case they forgot. Um, and, you know, there's a, sometimes when the wait time becomes uncomfortable for me, it's not uncomfortable for them. It's uncomfortable for me. But if I just wait one little bit beyond that, all of a sudden I get something more than I expected. Um, in fact, the other day I got from one of my students, I was waiting for one of my students to, to greet the classroom with, because she sometimes gets um, a little stubborn and, and, and likes the extra attention. That's also part of wait time, you guys. And um, I had another student say, I need help. And I'm like, are you saying that you need help? Or are you saying that she needs help? And then the, the student that said, I need help using her device laughed. And it really was about helping out her friend saying, maybe you need to say it a different way, which I did. And then I got what I needed. So, you know, my students prompt me too. <laughs> you know what though, that, that reminds me of a different story. Uh, by the way, the, the Christmas thing was so, so beautiful. And it was a personal little letter that she's like, I believe in this, this student. And these are the things I know about her. And I'm going to, I'm committed to waiting to learn more. And it was just so beautiful. And it was so personal. 
Um, but that brings me, when you were saying something, waiting for someone to greet, I, even that was something new, right? Like you were like, so tell, communication is actually them telling you something you don't already know. So having hello on a button and passing it around the circle time is still your word, right? So talk about kind of how you, how even that was an aha moment and that you, you've changed what you do there. Right. Um, so um, what I used to do is I used to say, say hello to your friends. All right. Say hello to your friends. Say hello. Hello. Say hello. Oh, here's a, a Big Mac or use your device. And instead, at the beginning of the day, I sit down in circle time and um, it's it's beginning to come naturally because isn't that what we do anyway? I might prompt them a little bit by saying, hey, how are you this morning? And then all of a sudden, one of the kids is like, hello. It's like, oh, look, they just said hello. And, and, um, and then all of a sudden, we get more of that. Now, there are some kids who don't but they might greet a different way. And the fact they listen to each other and, and there's some smiles that go on, it's, it's really powerful. But what's most powerful is it's coming from them. Um, and, and just like you walk in a typical classroom and you say, you know, hi, Debbie, you know, and they say hi back. It, it's the it's same thing. And so it's, it's natural communication and it shows um, social competence to me, honestly. Mm -hmm. Right. I feel like you got away from um, kind of like, because, oh, well, if I script it, then everyone gets a turn. And then I then every, then I get to say everybody said something. And I think I think that is a very common. And by the way, in lots of ways, that's better than some because they're the devices are out. They're on. They're in front of them. <laughs> right. But um, but then you were like, wait, though, that that the bar is higher than they're on and in front of them. And there, and that there's a right answer. What if somebody wants to say what's up and somebody else wants to say, Hey, and someone else wants to say, I feel fill in the blank. Or how right? about saying goodbye? <laughs> <laughs> right. I think it won't be. It's, well, I have one little stinker right now who that's their favorite thing to say. And then they <laughs> giggle. Um, and, and that's, you know, the one that we were talking about before we started mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, she's fifth grader and is developing a wicked sense of humor that I don't think that um, we knew that she had, but she's got a wicked sense of humor. So, yeah, uh, most recently we've gotten a lot of bye, goodbye. And then and then I wait for a minute. You know, other people say say something then that all of a sudden I get, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's like, it's yeah. OK. So by giving them some autonomy and some natural, you're finding out more about your students than you might have otherwise, if they just do what kind of you had expected them to do. Their personalities just shine through. Absolutely. That, you know, when, um, when I was kind of, I never forced my students to do anything, but it's the best word I can come up with. I was forcing them to say hello in a certain way or at a certain time period. Yeah, or or anything during groups. You know, when we have science, I uh, they are allowed, they they make comments and they tell me their opinions and you know um, and or sometimes they go to completely different pages and saying something completely different and and honestly, a lot of times it really fits. And if you think about it, sometimes I have to to you really rack my brain about why did they go there? And sometimes it's like you know no reason at all. But that's but we still need to respond. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Right. Definitely. Marla, do all of your students have an AAC device? No. Um, right now, one of my new girls does not. And in fact, when I was talking to their parents before they came in, they're like, oh, no, we, we're teaching her sign language. We don't want an AAC device. And, and I'm like, oh, really? Why is that? And they're like, well, it's just it's just too much bother. And it's it's it's. Um, it's just too much. It's beyond her. And I said, well, you know, we can talk about that. So um, the district gave me a device that um, has, what does it have on it? Touch chat. It's an iPad with touch chat. Mm -hmm. And what she really needs is a, um, a finger guard. So she doesn't, you know, or a key guard, whatever, to, so that she doesn't um, accidentally rest, rest her hands elsewhere. But, you know, since she's been in my class and this is maybe her fourth week, I, I took a video. <laughs> of how she was doing with it because yeah. she's my, my kid who's who's also a little bit verbal 
um, uh, she could say hi and no, which is her favorite answer to everything. And, um, and I took a video and all of a sudden they're, they're in line to get her evaluated. So, um, wow. it, it, it's, I, 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 I could have lectured them. Right. I could have said, well, this is the reason why we do it. And mm -hmm. I did say, you know, I, that's kind of our specialty in our classroom is, is communication because our room is full of amazing ways to communicate, which I've learned from, you know, Carolyn Musswhite and Deanna Wagner, who came in and trained me for two years. Um, because before that, I was, I was not as I, I was doing okay, but I was not, I, I was using the, um, the Big Mac as a fly swatter which I learned um, anyway. So, um, so, you know, I didn't lecture them. I, I let them discover it through seeing what their daughter could do. Hmm. That video is so powerful. That's a great idea. Okay. Now tell go back to the fly swatter. Tell us what you learned. Oh, well, you know, um, I was actually embarrassed. <laughs> What I learned, but I was using the iPad as a fly swatter. Basically, what it means is I put something on there. Let's go back to greetings, and so I, I put hi on there or hello there or what 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 are you doing? And and I, I I give each child a chance to 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 touch it and and say something, but they're not really saying anything. I've taught them mm -hmm. how to touch the eye, the um, Big Mac. Um, so one of the things I did learn is so during morning meeting. We do use the Big Macs um, because I want the kids to be able to make their reports. And so I I used to be able to use kids' um, voices to record it because, you know, they don't need to sound like me. Um, but And we're getting back to that now that COVID is going away somewhat. Um, so I have more mm -hmm. of in my classroom again. But, you know, the kids have to wait with their iPad or their, their Big Mac on their table. And if they give their report at the wrong time, I say, oh, oops, um, I don't think it was your turn. Can you, can you wait your turn? Um, because that turn taking stuff is really good or mm -hmm. oh, oh, that doesn't make sense. But, but you know, it's, it's their volitional movement. It's not, not my saying it's your turn. <laughs> right. You're not just putting it there when it's their turn and taking it away. You're teaching exactly some skills. Was horribly embarrassed. <laughs> well, Marla, that we just, we, we've all got something to be embarrassed about, right? That we're always learning. So we appreciate your candor. Definitely. Um, but we're learning from your stories. And I wouldn't be embarrassed because I think everyone has a place where they're starting, right? So what you were doing was trying to include everybody and you were trying to do that in a way that everyone could access. And so there was a lot of good things behind that intent, right? And then you, when you realize, oh, I'm actually not achieving the goal I was hoping for, then I got to make the changes. So what did, what did you learn most from those two years with Deanna and um, Caroline Messaway? Oh, by my gosh. Um, we worked an awful lot on authentic um, name writing using the alphabet. Um, before that, it's like, um, I didn't, I've never bought into the um, notion that my kids can't learn. I've never bought into that notion. Um, because, you know, when I first started in my classroom, my kids were taking an afternoon nap for 45 minutes. Um, it was basically a daycare when I took over. And I was like, um, no. And I started doing reading with them. All the, and my aides were like, what are you doing that for? It's like, because it's school. Um, and, and so I had been doing things with, you know, an alphabet of the week, which, you know, by the way, I never really liked doing alphabet of the week because I thought that was kind of like, well, gosh, by the time we get to Z, they've forgotten about A. And so I learned about authentic name, uh, name writing and authentic writing using alternative pencils and, and, um, and putting meaning to their their scribbles that they're making. And so through all that, of course, it's all based on communication too, because um, I, 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 was just, I know this is kind of an R-rated story, but I had a, a, a student write, um, she was mad at me, really mad at me. And she wrote FK to FK and then after that you. Um, and I'm like, I'm thinking, did she really mean that? <laughs> because, you know, I'm, and then she looks at me. So I'm like, I, oh my, <laughs> she was an eighth grader. 
<laughs> so um, uh, I'm thinking maybe, you know, and I didn't say that, you know, what the words were. I'm like, oh, you must be really upset with me because you wrote that in your in in your authentic name writing or you know one of my kids um most recently she has a dog and um the dog's name is kai and we were writing about what we like and um she picked the letters k and i k and i and you know and we were just saying i like and i thought she was going to talk about because she loves bruno mars loves cardi b loves music more than anything and it's like oh, are you talking about your dog did you write kai and the biggest smile came up and the biggest giggle because that's what she does when i'm right um you know i figured her out finally i think that's what she says <laughs> says to herself <laughs> oh yeah miss marla finally figured me out <laughs> so she she wrote kai so that was those were some of the important things that i learned that you know that you could communicate it more than just using a communication device or a Big Mac, you could do writing. And when Deanna did a spelling test with him the first day, I thought, oh, she's crazy. <laughs> and, and you know what, Deanna knows I said that. Um, and then and then I got it. It, it took a while, but I, I, I truly understand what it's about. And, and so my kids all have the alphabet also available on their communication devices. Um, and we pull it up regularly. And one of my kids the other day was was um, going to eat a lot when my boys and and basically it turned out that he had not finished his breakfast because he didn't want to, which is unusual for him. And basically, I'm like, oh, you want to eat? And and that and that's what it was. So they well, find a way. I have so much, I have a couple things yeah. to say about that. One you are in close enough contact with your families that you knew she got a dog and that the dog's name was Kai. And so that when you're saying we're doing, I like, we're doing predictable chart lighting with, I, I like you and you're saying, Oh, well, no, if you want Cardi B, here's a C. If you want Bruno Mars, there's an M Kai's wrong. Like K is wrong. I don't, I don't know anything that you like that starts with a K. Right? right. So the other thing is, is like, even if you didn't know her dog's name was Kai, you were going to write K-I and then you might, you might even go, I don't know. I'm going to find out mom. I'm going to ask mom later. Right. But you have such a um, fluid relationship with all your families that you know, with the new, the new members and you know, mom's pregnant. So when the kid says I have a secret and you know, you know, the different things that come up so that you, so that that even furthers, you know, you have a presumed competency, but then they've proved their competence when you know the home life too. And I think that's what I find too, because I go to home and school, sometimes um, the school will say, I don't know, they, she, she talks a lot about horses and then I'll be like, oh, well, have you been to their house? They have horses, right? They, and, and you realize the school doesn't know that. So it seems like it's a perseveration or it seems out of context or it seems like it's not relevant to the conversation and you're like oh no and that horse name is chocolate so i get why food leads to horses for 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 her or whatever right and so that home to school connection is super important so and it and it validates what they say and it validates what seems to be spelled or said out of context when you know a little more about their context well right and i I have a communication book that I send home and I write in daily and then there's a part on the back. So I've used um, board maker um, symbols so I can circle like, you know, they went to music and all this other stuff. So the kids can read it too, even though I want them to read ABC words as well. But, you know, um, um, I've got that. And then on the, on the back, the parents also have board maker symbols that they, ha uh, my hope, okay, my hope was that they would sit with their kid and circle what they did, you know, ate at home, I did this, and then a, and a section for them to um, write a report about what they did the night before. And then, and during morning meeting, then we read those. And, um, and for my kids who almost never have a report, I make things up because it's not fair that they don't have it. Um, you know, and then I periodically say, you know, the kids really loved and um and find value in reporting about what they did at school or at home the night before um so that's that's also how i learned a lot of stuff like one of my kids 
um, is going jet skiing this week. Uh, I, and and parents will send in pictures too. And and I can't wait to, he to hear about him going jet skiing because that sounds amazing. Is that the day on the lake thing? I, I don't think so. Um, they were supposed to go to uh, Lake Powell. They all went to Lake Powell with a houseboat, but he and his dad both got sick right before they oh, went. They didn't get so to it's go. it's not adapted jet skiing. No, this is the, oh. you know that, well, that family, I, I have to say, I have a couple, oh, oh, I, most of my families are pretty amazing that yeah. they do, do stuff with their kids. They mm -hmm. don't, you know, they don't um, just sit around. I mean, they mm -hmm. do stuff. One of my kids is at Harry Potter World. <laughs> I wanted to go to, by the way, oh. <laughs> <Harry> <laughs> this week too and 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 they sent pictures back which amazed our ot about how she was holding her wand with two fingers <laughs> she does not do during ot sure Karen. but that's pretty motivating you don't want to drop that wand yeah no kidding well i love that um i love that home to school connection and school to home connection piece like you said you're learning about them and then their peers are learning about each other right they're hearing things that they like Maybe then you're talking about how you're the same, how you're different, all that kind of thing. And Marla, I imagine that some of these reports of what's what I did last night kind of thing in the morning leads to other discussions. And I, I'm assuming you're, you kind of become okay with changing your, from what I've heard, you're changing your schedule a bit, right? Or how, yeah. what is that like? <laughs> Yeah, the well, flexibility. You know, if they have something that they're interested in, for example, right now we're our, our, um, we're really jumping into all kinds of different um, topics. Like this, this next week we're going to be talking about um, Eddie the elephant, which is a little guy who um, elephant that uses AAC. It was written by somebody who lives up in um, Canada. I don't know who it is because I don't have my book yet. It's coming in the mail this week. Anyway, um, so we really look into that stuff. But if, if like um, last week before we went on break, um, we were doing, um, oh, we were working with um, uh, a dinosaur book, um, The Dirty Dinosaur. And the kids were really into it. But one of the kids um, started doing something else with the pudding that we were using um, uh, and and ran a, a, a truck across it instead of a dinosaur so so i'm like oh we're mud racing over here because you know we, we were doing a dirty dinosaur book but when we we're finished we went we did some mud racing we made some pictures using the the wheels of the truck because that's all of a sudden they weren't as interested in the dinosaur at the end um, they were interested in rolling that truck across and making a big uh, mess and then talking about it one of the one of my kids said, oh, I'm not sure about that. And it's one of my <laughs> little prissy girls. And I'm like, well, you don't have to, but you know, this is what we're doing now. And, and um, one of my girls said, yuck. I'm like, okay, well, that's fine. What would you like to do? So instead of doing the truck thing, they, they played in the, um, the water that we um, were going to wash up in and, and, and that was fine too. Um, but they directed it. We, and by the way, um, we did finish the Dirty Dinosaur book, um, but we also included the other stuff too, because they because um, there was interest there. Um, but I didn't always do that, you guys. When I first started, I coming from the world of music therapy and to coming from doing my student teaching in first grade and having there was a glut of teachers when I started teaching. So I didn't get a first grade position. So I got a music position and I taught all the special ed kids. And that's how I, I, I got my classroom. But um, I, I, when I went into the classroom, I knew how to teach. I just didn't know how to teach my kids, especially what on earth are all these devices around the room. And um, I was very lucky that my speech pathologist at the time, who's now my speech pathologist again, um, uh, there was a, a gap of like 17 years where she wasn't with me. She went to a different district, but she told me about the, um, the state department, uh, department of education has an AAC person or a person who's um, well-versed in working with my kids. And they came out and showed me so much cause and effect things on online, um, how to use switches, how to use um, 
communication devices. And back then, not a single one of my kids had a communication device, by the way. And so I learned by doing and, and I also didn't understand when I first started. And neither did my speech pathologist because um, I lost my uh, the one that I have now for a while. And, and there's not all speech pathologists learn about AAC, AAC by the way. Um, it's, it's something that, you know, I've had a couple of them who, who were trying to dig into it, but, you know, they saw their Arctic kids and all this other stuff. And, and my kids were kind of, you know, it's like learning AAC they thought was too hard. And so um, it became my responsibility more. And I didn't understand for a while why everybody had something different because it wouldn't it be so much easier. If everybody had the same vocabulary for goodness sake. <laughs> and um, I wasn't able to understand until, you know, um, I had an, another speech pathologist who understood it and I had people coming in and doing their evaluations in my school. Then I understood why everybody's different and, and how to, um, how to learn to work them all within the same lesson, but it was a steep learning curve. I bet. And, and, you know, because you had a whole classroom with no tech, you do a lot of low tech still because high tech, high tech requires positioning. High tech requires a lot, a lot of things, ducks in a row, frankly. So I see the low tech board behind you. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the low tech things you do? Sure. Sure. Um, there's a lot of low tech. So I have here, let me go like this. I uh, can you see, there you go. Yeah. This is a core board that has, I think they're three and a half by three and a half inches. Um, I, I have one also in my room. That's a two by two that I have that I can take anywhere in the room. I also have some that are static that I have um, frames that can go around the words so that when we are doing specific words that we're um, learning about certain specific core words, we can really work on their motor planning. Um, and um, so those are removable, so I can take them off and, and, and when I'm teaching a book, like we just did, uh, uh, Groovy Joe, <laughs> Ice Cream and Dinosaurs. Um, and, you know, it's I like ice cream was a lot in there and they wanted more and they stomped in. So I pulled those words off so they could really focus on them. But I also showed them that at the end, we also did a lot of um, work on our devices. Some of our kids have core words. Some of my kids have um, fewer core words and that's okay. Um, and so um, that's how we use them. Um, I, I let my kids play the toys unless they ask um, for the toy because it's like, I'm not going to read your mind. I used to do a lot of mind reading. Yeah, you want this toy. And they didn't play with it. And gosh, you know, <laughs> I laugh now, but it's like, um, I'm sure that my students, you know, they've taught me a whole lot more than I think that I, I will ever teach them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and compassion and, and um, I don't know if, and love is some of the greatest lessons. Yeah, I, that's exactly how I feel too. I feel like I've learned more from my people than my people will ever learn from me, you know? Um, and everything I know is because somebody, somebody on the other end of that AAC had the patience to dig their feet in until I changed the way I was doing something, you know, and that's how I have learned a lot as well. Mm -hmm. um, so if you were, if you were, um, we're so off script, I don't even know what we were supposed to ask, but I'm just going to tell you, like, if you were to talk to a brand new special ed teacher right now, what, what are some, what are the, you know, top two, three things that you would tell them the, what do you wish you knew your first couple years? <laughs> and Marla, while you're thinking about that, uh, no, the things I wish I'd known. You know, that's that. Uh, there's a lot that I'd wish I'd known, but I think that um, I think what I wish I would have known was that I the wait time. I think is honestly the most important thing, and I and and I le really learned more about that over this last six months eight months than I, than I have in the whole 19 years I've been in my classroom. 
I thought I gave them wait time. I thought I did. Um, but when I truly give them wait time, that's when the magic occurs. Um, mm. And then the other thing I, I wish I'd know is to, um, you know, I, when I first started the AAC, even was like, you know, they're, they're stimming, they're stimming, they're stimming. And um, now I have, I have one girl who goes on her device that has the garb that, you know, provides her that, that extra stimulation. But I'm able to pick some words out there that maybe that she's talking about. Even though she doesn't eat, she talks about a lot. She goes to that page a lot and talks about, you know, um, and she always ends up on ice cream Sunday. And so, you know, I, I contacted dad and it looks, sounds like their family has them a lot. So instead of just, just discounting that as, as nothing, mm. um, it really is something they are communicating, whether you think they're stimming or not. And um, I think that we label things stimming too quickly, or I will, I will, I will own that. I think I used to, mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. definitely not and the other thing I would say about stimming is what's so wrong with it like if they say the same word up four or five times I, I, I don't think that I don't think that that deserves one that we remove the AAC <laughs> right I don't think we restrict them from doing anything of that and and it just it, it it if they need to hear that a few times to know that everybody's heard what they have to say you know if they need to hear it a few times for their sensory system I just don't see the damage I, I feel like calling it STEM, even if it is STEM, is um, doesn't mean then they're not ready for AAC. They never they never stop stimming on AAC because we've waited another year to get them a system. They all, you know what I mean. If the stimming is going to go down, it's going to be because they get more comfortable with it. And I think that some of some of that stuff um, labeling things as stimming, and you know while we have amazing OTs and PTs and everything who are uh, uh, amazing, truly amazing. I think that, that um, we don't have enough education about that stuff. And, you know, I, I, in the last, what, maybe two and a half years, I've been making sure that their devices go with them everywhere. Um, and I, I, in fact, I just recently had a conversation with one of my parents about the fact that, you know, don't, if you don't, um, charge it overnight, then your child cannot speak when they go to music and library today, because mm -hmm. there's not a cord, uh, I mean, a plug available for them to, to plug in their AAC device. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they need to take it everywhere. And, and um, um, one of my kids the other day, um, we were in an assembly, and when it was really quiet, she said, sorry. And um, I, I just looked at her and I, and I was like, oh, sorry. And then I, then I realized that, you know, she had um, pulled a big hole in her, in her stockings. <laughs> and, oh. I'm like, and now everybody in the school knows that she can talk. So instead yeah. of being embarrassed that she said, sorry, when everything was quiet, it's like, Ooh, you, you talked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a bit of, a bit of, um, there's a lot of what you're saying, like the wait time is where the magic happened. I love how you said you wait in that uncomfortable silence and then you wait a little bit more than you think you need to and you get more is what you said earlier today. Um, and then and then assigning, talking about whatever it is, if they are talking about something, it may not seem like it's on topic to us at that moment, you're going to make a comment about it and probably figure out how it actually has to do with what we're talking about um, or finding out more about students as we let them have some wait time and ability to, to say what it is that we don't know they're going to say. Love right. That. And I can't say enough about that wait time. And, and um, again, I'm going to say it's not comfortable. You guys, it's not. And sometimes um, I, I've basically have had not I have not said shut up to my aides, but I've you know I've given them the look like you know stop prompting them because when you prompt them then they're gonna be, they're gonna think about the prompting instead of what they need to say too and that and that was a hard lesson for my um, instructional assistants honestly because they are also wanting the kids to perform. I was gonna yeah. ask you about this, Marla. How do you how do you model this and kind of be explicit about teaching all this? um to your 
other than giving them the evil eye, you mean? <laughs> um, we talk an awful lot about it um, every Friday now. So, so my professional development goal this year was that I would be able to teach without having to give direction, constant direction to my aides. And what that means is I have to do a lot more training with them because I would be teaching and then I'd look up and I'd say they're finished already because, you know, if they're finished already, that means you did it instead of them. And, um, and it's like, you know, which would have then interrupt what I was doing with my group in front of me. And that means I wasn't paying full attention to who I was teaching. And, and that, that's gone on for a while. And, and unfortunately, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I had some aides who I had for 11 or 12 years, but, you know, after a while, people leave and that's fine. And they move, mm-hmm. they move on and they live their lives. And so I have some new people that I'm training. And so my goal this year is, is to really do a lot of training. So every Friday, um, that's what we do. We sit down and we talk about what went well this week, what what could have changed. And then there's a different topping every every time, like why we do hand underhand and not hand overhand, um, why we presume competence, why we um, and wait, waiting has been a topic probably every week because um, it's not easy, um, it, it, whether it's waiting for them to talk while they're waiting that for them to use their their pincer grasp to, to get something with a fine motor group, while they're, it's waiting for them to push themselves forward in their wheelchair so they can help you stand up. Because if you help them every time, then they're going to learn that you're going to help them every time and they're not going to do it. Hmm. Um, if you if you jump in and, and, and modeling, I don't think is not waiting, but if, if you jump in and model too often, it's, it's kind of like, you know, when I was raising my kids, um, when I would tell them something four times, I taught them to wait till the fourth time before, you know, mom gets mad. Um, so I think the same thing. If we, if we keep going after them and after them and after them, they, they know that they can wait. I mean, they cannot do it because, you know, well, let's, and, and sometimes my fifth grade girl sometimes tries to, um, be a fifth grade girl. First of all, just because she's got a, a cognitive issue doesn't mean that she's not developmentally appropriate. And she, um, like all fifth grade girls, and I've had her, this is my sixth year. So it's kind of like I'm another parent. She tests me and sometimes is naughty because she can be. Yeah. It is what it is. I think you're right though. I think, um, if we jump in, we, we actually teach a level of passivity. I mean, a I, lot think, of passivity. I think a lot of our kids have learned passivity and some of it's just because they physically weren't able to do things. And so they actually, they talk about wait time and how patient they have to be, right? They're waiting for someone else to transfer them to, to do all kinds of things. So when they get a minute and you're waiting on them, you know, they hold the floor a little bit. They hold your attention there. There's a lot of actually beautiful things that happen when they know that you're hanging on, you're waiting them out. Yeah. And one of my girls who was doing amazing things um, was the one that who, who would tell her friend that, you know, you need, I, I need help, which meant you need help. Um, she had stopped talking for a while and not talking much at all. And, um, you know, I, I was, so I had written on her progress report and all of a sudden she started talking again because um, by the way, at home, I mean, the, the you know, that people have been sick and all this other kind of stuff. So, you know, people were jumping right in there and taking care of them before they needed help. Mm-hmm. Again, you know, at home, knowing what was going on at home helps. But I told her mom, I said, I think that she read my progress note because <laughs> it's proving me wrong these last two days since I wrote it. And, and that's what you want to see. But I know the two girls you're talking about and they, they egg each other on. They actually talk more. They talk more when they're around each other because they're actually not best friends. And, um, <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, but that's so how, how normal is that? Right. Like she bugs me. So, and no, if she's going to talk for me, then I'm going to talk. 
I mean, that's basically what happened. And then the other one is going to jump in and answer the question or do what, you know, try to help. And it's like, uh, uh-uh, uh, no, I didn't want to do it, but now that you're going to do it for me, I'm not having it. Right. And so you didn't orchestrate them to work against each other. They, they did that all on their own, but as, yeah. as fifth grade girls do. <laughs> and I, I used to have them in speech therapy together in a speech therapy group. And then I decided that my two kids that have eye gaze machines, that would be more beneficial for them to be together. Mm-hmm. And, it, and then, you know, it's like, hmm, it's um, okay. So the one, um, uh, the one girl wasn't doing very well with her, her partner. And, and at the end she was just, you know, not, she hadn't done anything, the whole speech therapy group. I'm just going to be honest. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, and, and, and Shauna was like, well, you know, um, you need to let me know you're done. And she never let us know. And the other girl's partner was absent. So I'm like, Oh, double, double speech therapy today. (laughs) And so she was with the other girl who is younger than her. She doesn't like younger girls. Uh, That's her deal. Yeah. And all of a sudden, uh, all of a sudden, you know, the, my, my younger girl was doing stuff and my older girl was like, Hmm, she's not going to do better than me. And I'm like, well, double speech therapy works. Yeah. (laughs) Just kind of double potions. You know, she's the one that's over in, in um, Harry Potter world. So, you know, double (laughs) potions, double transfiguration, double speech. Um. (laughs) Oh, Lucky, I mean, so, I, so we're going to start putting them together again, even though it's not a match made in heaven for one of them. Um, it is a match made in heaven for us because all of a sudden she's, she's motivated to talk because she's not going to let the other girl outdo her. Well, and what I think, I think you made a comment. I mean, I think you made an assumption that I wonder if the I guess people should all be together, right? Because then they're modeling kind of each other's language system and they're modeling each other's access method. But communication is about, you know, is about making human connection or, or, um, or rejecting thereof. Right. So having strong opinions about it is going to bring out communication for sure. Oh, we we've got a um, comment in the chat that the more love for the Eddie, the elephant book that you talked about, Marla, that's coming out. And, um, that this person is saying they're going to try to get one for every library in their school district. They're doing wow. a grant. Yeah. Well, you, most, um, you know, here's my thing. So I have a pl- plan for next week and if it doesn't arrive, I know it's on YouTube. <laughs> so yeah. it's, going to be, it's going to be, you know, it, one way or the other. I prefer doing it myself so that I can uh, have the icons below the book. So they're seeing the book with my, with my uh, overhead pro- projector system. And then I can sit with them individually and read it. Um, I really don't like to project things on YouTube a lot because I think there's a level of passivity there. Um, and, and it's harder to have wait time, right? I mean, you can, you can quickly try and, and run over there and, and push pause and stuff, but it's, it's just not as organic as it needs to be. Um, but I'm excited about that, Eddie, the elephant. When I found it, when I was planning for, for this week, I was like, I hope it gets here in time. Um, <laughs> And Marla, I think it's a perfect way to, to start off our, our new quarter, so. Yeah, yeah, Marla's currently on a fall break right now, so um, we appreciate she's joining us. M- Marla, you said, um, you said you project the book and you have the icons. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh-huh. So, um, for example, last week when I did uh, Groovy Joe, Ice Cream and Dinosaur by Eric Litwin. It's the same guy who used to do Pete the Cat. Um, and um, he, so he's the original Pete the Cat person. And he has a new little guy, who, well, not new, a guy called Groovy Joe. And it has all the magic of the early Pete the Cat books. Um, so lots of repetition, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of great core words. And so I would read the book and then right below it, I would have, um, you know, uh, stomped in the room and I would put the word in in the middle of the picture of the book and then I would demonstrate in, and then um, and then I wouldn't make them immediately um, um, show me an icon of in because that's that's just too much but then then the next time you know they would help me read it so I'd have the icons 
on a Velcro board and stomp in the room so they could see the word while I did it. Um, because I think, um, of course, always repetition with, with, um, with changes um, is really important. So, and we're really looking at the word in a lot and like, um, because we still use uh, the curriculum Meville, Meville to Weville. Um, I know it's an old curriculum, but it's a really good one for going through core words. And it, it goes through all the things that are really important to my kids. So until I find something better, um, I, I mean, um, there are really good ones out there. Readtopia and all those, all those, um, curriculum, but for my classroom, this one seems to work the best. Um, but anyway, so I use that. Um, so I, I can use this board behind me and I can point to the words or I can pull the words off and put on, on that uh, Velcro thing and, and, and let them see it. And I can put it on board and, and as many ways as I can get them to see it and feel it and act it out, then they learn the word better and, and, um, and so, and then we use, you know, the word in, like they have a, um, their communication devices during cooking. We did a, a Groovy Joe cooking activity and, um, you know, they use the word in a lot for helping me put things into the recipe. Um, okay. We, we made ice cream, of course, ice cream and dinosaurs. So that sounds fun. Groovy Joe's new to me. So that's a fun little tidbit. <laughs> it's fun. I, you know, um, Pete the cat books and and um, Groovy Joe books that they have they have that repetition just like some of the Eric Carl books did and that, that repetition with um, very within a book is so important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> Marla, we're we're ending each of our podcasts by asking, um, what do you want people to know about and. Um, for you, we were kind of wondering, you know, with um, he, special ed teachers are special people and um, you are obviously a special person. You're just a person, right? But but um, you would love your, you know, love your students. It sounds like I bet your students love you. Um, there's all these other things you think about during your day. Here you are um, on your time off talking to us about the people that you love. Um, and you've got IEPs. Um, there's so much to think about MTSS and inclusion and all of these pieces and all of the goals and the writing and all that that you think about all, during the day. Um, what we want to know, what do you want people to know about special ed teachers right now? Wow. <laughs> um, well, first of all, you know, um, I was uh, online with somebody the other day. Oh, I'm getting a new cochlear implant. And so I had to deal with them because um, they kept getting it wrong. Anyway, so um, I was telling my special ed teacher and she, she said, oh, it takes a special person. And what I want them to know is really special ed teachers, we're just teachers. Um, <laughs> and we are the luckiest teachers because, you know, what, where other people see that, you know, all these poor students, those poor students are the most amazing people who give so much of themselves and they, and I feel like um, I'm the student a lot of times and they're the teacher and I'm the luckiest person there. Mm -hmm. um, and, but the other thing about special ed teachers is just because we're in special education and we, and we supposedly know this stuff doesn't mean that you can't teach us stuff. I, I, I'm, my um, SLP has taught me so much um, and um and even the ones who, who didn't know anything about my students, the SLPs have taught me so much about um, structure and how to, um, to um, teach little things and, and, and within the big things. And, um, and so everybody has a lot to give. And, and just because I've been doing this for 19 years and it uh, doesn't mean I know everything because I'm learning things every day. Um, so, you know, special ed teachers were just people who mm -hmm. just um, maybe take the time. Maybe, maybe my students give me wait time. <laughs> maybe that's it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we, we, we appreciate that, Marla. We see that you're constantly learning um, and you've shared a lot of that learning with us. We appreciate that. And, and I keep... think you seek it out too. You're like, oh, is this an opportunity for me? Um, is this a class that I should take? Is this something I can join? Is there one tidbit I'm going to learn from this? Um, 
or can I sit in in the evaluation so I can learn um, what you guys look at, or um, I, can I see what other devices are out there? Mm -hmm. Because you know, just because somebody doesn't do direct select well in my classroom doesn't mean that they can't direct select when they're with you, and that it teaches me something new. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, this has been so much fun. And I know, I know this resonates with so many special ed teachers out there. And I know that so many of us as SLPs or OTs or paraeducators or support staff to you, um, you know, we, everybody, everybody in the team has something to contribute. And I think that's what you're saying too. And it's like, it's like, it's almost like giving wait time to everyone in your team. It's like, what do you have to contribute? And I'm going to actually not fill that in for you. I'm going to let you tell me what you know, what you don't know, what you want to work on. I love that you meet with your pairs weekly instead of some, you know, once a quarter situation where you're doing a check-in, because I think, I think, um, you know, you can think you're being clear, in, in an instruction, this happens to me all the time. I think I'm being clear in the instruction. And then six months later, I find out, oh, that wasn't clear. And that means we didn't quite do it the way we, we, we really wanted to do it, right? Because I, I didn't even realize my message wasn't clear. So I love um, your quest to continue to learn and your quest to make sure everybody else is is getting it or is, is um, feeling heard and seen, not just your students, but your support people as well. So well, you learn more when they have questions, honestly, because if, if, you know, I don't know that they don't understand if they don't ask me about it and they, and we're so busy during the day, they don't have time to ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really yeah. good, good idea. Well, we really appreciate you coming. It is the end of the time. I know people are hopping off. Thank you so much, Marla, for, for joining us today. All right. Thanks for having me.